The following program was provided by an independent producer solely responsible for its content. The opinions expressed do not necessarily represent the views of this station, its staff, board of directors, or underwriters. Every day, citizens around the country are faced with new dilemmas. Dilemmas that affect them profoundly. Whether it's injustice, discrimination, falling through the cracks, scandal and cronyism, balances of power, ethics, religious freedom, state versus citizens and unfunded mandates, and the list goes on and on and on. Welcome to Speak Up. It's directed at those who have fallen through the cracks, and it gives them a voice. It's your turn to speak up, to stand up and fight back. Welcome to Speak Up. I'm Kevin Avard, your host. In the past, we've talked many times about family court issues, and we've seen little progress over time here in New Hampshire. As a matter of fact, it seems as though we're getting more and more complaints on a weekly basis. If you were to look at my emails as a senator, you'd hear tragedies and stories where people's civil rights are being violated on a regular basis. It's time we continue to take a look at the problem, the ongoing problem that happens over and over again. Many people think that it's just happening to men, but it's happening to both men and women, and their children are being separated from them. Today I have uh, David Smith, uh, my guest. Uh, David, welcome to the show. Now, David, yeah. you're, you're a volunteer firefighter in, in uh, Dumbarton, New Hampshire? Correct. And uh, you, are, you have a profession, you're a locksmith? Correct. And uh, I recently uh, had, a, I had a conversation with you at my desk at, uh, in my office up at the Senate, and you were, you were talking about a, a story which I've heard time and time again. You've gone through a, a divorce or a, of some sort, and you've not committed any crimes. Correct. None. Nothing. There's no sheet. There's, no, there's nothing there to, to say, you know, David, you're a criminal, and you're a danger to your child. I'm an outstanding citizen. You teach and you coach basketball? Correct. How long have you been, been, been coaching basketball? Well, basketball uh, was just actually this season. Okay. But you've coached in, in the time? In sports. Sports in, in the past. Baseball. Have you ever been soccer. thrown out uh, for, for coaching? No. All right. Now, I, I haven't asked you that question before. Right. No. Uh, never been arrested for a violent crime or domestic violence or anything like that? No, I have not. So the question comes back, and, and, and it baffles my mind that this is continuing to happen. You have not seen your son in two years. Just that... under, yeah, just under two years. In that two-year process, you've gone through 10 judges? No, it's actually been about a seven-year process. Um, yeah, 10 judges. 10 judges. Yeah. How many guardian ad litems? Uh, just one. One guardian. How much did that guardian ad litem cost you? Oh, it's in the $5,000 range. I mean, I, I actually fired her or asked to have her removed on more than one occasion. Why? Because I, I didn't feel that she was um, working in my son's best interest. All right. And, and they are supposed to work in, in, in the child's best interest. And, and what were some of the things that she was doing that, that gave you the clue that, well, you know what, you're not really working out to, to make sure that, that my son is taken care of. What was she doing? Well, th there would be length of times uh, in between any kind of meetings or conversations with attorneys um, and or Gregory, uh, my son as well as uh, she was never prepared for court cases. Um, the court would mandate that she would um, give her findings well in advance of um, the preliminary trial and the... Um, what do you mean by that? Mean by what? By the court giving her pre preliminary findings or she giving the court's preliminary right. findings. Well, um, she was to um, kind of you know, watch my son's life and how he was treated from both parents and make recommendations to the court for his best interest. Um, and then obviously as a parent, it was our job to, or our, our goal to do the best for our son. So um, to be able to properly speak on someone's words, you need time to you know, look at them, review them, make sure they're correct. 
um, so that when you are in the courtroom, you can eloquently speak. Um, I was pro se and still am pro se for many years because um, I didn't I didn't have the money to pay for it. So did they did she ever at any time have uh, watch you with with your son uh, um, she, when when you had your son? She personally never did. Um, there was another person brought in, uh, Nia Norman. Um, the Gardner Lightman was Barbara Griffin, mm -hmm. Griffin Law. Um, she brought in um, Nia Norman, who um, was what she was called the supervisor. Right. And she was around us, uh, Gregory and I, multiple times. Did and she file a report with the Guardian at Lightham? Um, to my knowledge, yes, but that was... Did you a, see that report? I was, that was not privy to that. I was not allowed to see Have it. Have you seen any of the reports from the Guardian at Lightham? All of them or just partial? Well, I would only know what I've seen, so would I assume they're all of them? I don't. Um, so, yeah, I mean, my answer is no, I have not seen all of them. Okay, so recently we passed in the Senate, and of course in, in the House uh, they, they've just passed a bill which says that the guardian at litem has to disclose to both parents their findings. Obviously, it raises suspicion. Why is the court not allowing you to see your son? Is it specifically due to finances? Or, or was there something in that report from the guardian at litem that said, you know what, he really shouldn't see his son? And if that's the case, why aren't you charged? I mean, if for, for me to answer that properly, I mean, there's many facets to the whole custody scenario. Um, I believe that the, you know, as I've stated already, that the Cardinal Militum didn't really do her job. She didn't look out for my son's best interest. Uh, previous to her coming on board, um, it was split 50-50 custody. Um, and I cared for my son quite well. Um, and we had a great relationship. And then um, as his mother moved from different towns, she needed more time slash control so through that, um, there was allegations made of abuse, um, verbal, physical, that were never proven. Um, but then again, they weren't disproven because she never actually followed through with anything. Um, there was a point where she made a recommendation, as you referenced, that I'm a locksmith via by trade. Um, part of my business is emergency based. And um, her recommendation after almost three and a half years of doing what's called a 5225, that's five days on, two days off, two days on, five days off. It was a recurring schedule um, that we were to do a seven on, seven off schedule. Um, and I told her that, that I didn't think that was a good idea for Gregory or um, for us, the parents. I said we had a great schedule, he was used to it, and she didn't want to hear it. She thought it was best for him. I asked her to explain herself, and she wouldn't. Um, so at the, at the um, preliminary hearing, she handed me, I think it was 11 pages of findings that I needed to address, which I couldn't because I didn't have time to review them. You didn't have a 10-day period? No, she did not. She actually filed the same day of the um, preliminary hearing, or the pretrial is what it's properly called, um, for a, um, to grant her um, for a late filing. And I objected, but I was pro se. I was told to sit down and that I had some time to review the documents and that I should take that time to review the documents. And I stated to the court that I was not able to... Who was the judge at the time? Um, that was a, a magistrate that would have been... Um, I have to look at it here because there were so many. It, it wasn't a judge because usually it's a marital master. Um, that was Deborah Kane Ryan. Um, and she didn't really care that I wasn't prepared because the information wasn't given. I had requested that information in advance as well. And you had that in writing? Uh, well, that in writing through um, pretrial. Yes, through your pretrial preparation. Um, and it wasn't given to you within a, a satisfactory It was of time. given the morning of the trial. Is that what precipitated the fact that you lost custody of your son? Was that the beginning? That was the first step. Um, and then what happened during that case, or during that pretrial, I, um, I stood up to the court and stated my case that that was unreasonable and, and unfair that she would be able to do this <clears throat> and that I couldn't properly, you know, take in all this information because it was a lot of information. Are the courts recognizing the fact that not only are you being separated from your, your, your son, but your son's being separated from you? Correct. I think that's the issue. I'm an adult. And, and, and what, but your, your son's civil rights are being violated here as well. Correct. And, and I, I believe at a Supreme Court uh, settled cases that both parents are what are in the best interest of the child, unless there is some eminent danger. Correct. Has that been established at any point? None whatsoever. 
So now the, here's this child going w without a father figure for two years. Have you been able to communicate with your son? I am, I am un uh, right now his mother has um, full say in, in any contact, let it be phone, and she is disallowing me any contact. The only way to my knowledge that I can get contact, which will be happening shortly, I hope, is to, I have to petition the court to have some supervised um, visitation, which will be like a, maybe like in a uh, police department or a YMCA. I'm not even really sure where they are, um, but that's the only way I'm going to see my son. Has your son tried to reach out to you? How old is your son? He's 13 and a half. 13. A teenager. And I haven't seen him grow. Uh, no, no reports on his grades or how he's doing in school, um, if he's all, involved? All I get from his mother is uh, medical bills. Um, and I asked for explanations recently. I got a medical bill that stated that he had a mild concussion. And I asked her to tell me what that was. It was a bill, uh, my half was $955. Why, why were your rights suspended as a parent? Um, well, uh, again, like I said, it was multifaceted. Um, so after the pretrial, um, there was a schedule. There was 60 days, 70 days from the pretrial to the final hearing. Um, and we stated, and the judge actually uh, mandated to the guard at litem that she had to provide me no less than 14 days in advance of the uh, final hearing her findings. And again, I got them the morning of the trial. And, and was the, was the guardian ad litem found in contempt? And no, she was allowed. She again petitioned to uh, file late, and I objected as a pro se um, a respondent, and it didn't matter. They let her do that, and she was billing us for her time. It wasn't. It was just wasn't a, a free job, for the lack of a better word. Um, and that um, that severely affected me. That two times the court let me down. Multiple times, but that was probably and, the icing on the cake. And your son, though, Correct. Well. well, let me down because I was working for my son is how I felt. For our relationship and his, his growth, his well-being. Well, there, this is obviously a, ca a classic case, you know, based upon what you said of, of what has been termed as parental alienation. And uh, from what we understand is, I mean, it has some long-term effects, obviously. But um, has your son tried to sneak out or tried to, 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 uh, to, to reach you? Hey, Dad, I'm okay, or yes. hey, can we get together? Yes, uh, it was a pretty sad scenario. Um, probably two years ago, um, he made an effort multiple times to contact me. Um, so we would speak on the phone regularly. Um, it was an every other day occurrence, which I kind of told him that every day was a lot. He was going into the woods and sneaking using his cell phone. Um, and you have those records of, of, of correct, yeah, all the calls, and that was I was actually brought up on contempt charges because for, he was talking to you because he was uh, speaking to me via phone. I also Who, brought. Can I ask what judge put you in contempt over that? Um, that would have been um, again. It's not a judge. It's a it's a master. Um, that would be uh, Michael Gardner. Um, uh, now you got a list of judges. Can you just over this uh, seven or ten year period of time you have. Seven. Ten judges. Correct. Could you just read off, read off their names? I can. It's Elizabeth. Oh, excuse me, Elizabeth um, Leonard, Paul Lawrence, Edward Gordon, Edward Tenney, Patricia. I'm not sure how to pronounce her last name because it was handwritten. Um, I think it's Quigley or Quayley. Susan Carbon. Are these these are all marital masters? No, these are the judges. Okay. James Patton. Um, and then a first initial, and then Stident and Jim Caro. Um, again, most of these people handwrite in a Sharpie pen their decisions, which are literally unlegible. But So you've gone through this many judges. So what are they, just throwing your, your case to it? Oh, I don't have time here. You know, obviously, the, this child doesn't need a, a father. So here, here judge, you, you take this, uh, and, and then they pass it on to the next judge. And you've had one guy, only one guardian at Lido. Correct. I mean, it's, it's pretty disheartening to think that my son um, is without a father and someone hasn't properly reviewed and or tried to understand this case. Now, recently you, you, you showed some documents basically showing how some of their orders are handwritten in, and it, it's actually written like a doctor, where sometimes if you read the prescription, you, you've got to really decipher that. Correct. And you've asked for clarification and you were denied on some of these clarifications. What is, what's up with that? 
Well, I, I, you know, again, I think it's um, it's a situation of the court really not doing their their full job, their aspect. Um, and you referenced it. Are you a second class Some, citizen? I consider myself a first class citizen. Right. So why are you being treated like that? Why is your son being treated like that? I guess that's the question. and That's why we're here to speak up. So you're getting these handwritten decisions. You've asked for clarification and then you are called in contempt or held in contempt for asking for a clarification? Well, that's not actually how it is, but it's, um, I was in contempt um, for what they were calling was late child support um, in the, in the um, child division of child services um, eyes. I'm 100%, 110% in compliance with my child support, um, but uh, my son's mother tends to um, ride every rail she can, for the lack of a better word. So what it was is it was written out, it's illegible, um, uh, being pro se, I, um, I asked for a motion for clarification. Of and what was actually written on this document. And I stated that I could not properly read it. I had asked a uh, court clerk at the um, Concord office of the Sixth Circuit, excuse me, Sixth Circuit Court Family Court to read it for me. And she said she couldn't because if she made an error, then she would be liable for that. So I said, well, this is why I'm asking for clarification. Um, then they did respond with a denial. Uh, on all counts, I asked a denial for of what? Of clarification, they would not. It, all they did was check a box. They literally checked the box that said denial um, in my motion. So, so then, you got to figure out my handwriting, or else. Um, so I wait. Um, there's a certain amount of time. There's a duration. I'm actually becoming pretty proficient at this, which is scary. Um, and so I had to um, do a motion for reconsideration and clarification of the. Uh, it was actually two different decisions. And on the second time, I just received it four days ago, a type, um, type, type decision. And now that information is almost 120 days old and actually moot um, because it was referencing that I hadn't paid child support, which I had. And, but the judge and or the marital master never reviewed that to see. I mean, that's public information through child support. Right. They can make a simple phone call. Now, do you mail in the checks to, or is it automatic? Correct, I, I mail them in. And it's usually a uh, 28, excuse me, 24 to 48 hour turnaround, and it's dispersed via, you know, electronically. Right, and that goes to uh, through the child, state. Yeah, DCSS, which right. is child. That business. way, they can document the fact that they received Correct. it. Yep. And, and I pay consistently at the end of the month, and always have. Yeah, we've heard stories where people have actually paid, and they paid the the, the whether the, the spouse or the the ex and the payee uh, and the payor <laughs> and there's never a receipt no documentation no, so I, you're better off just running it through the state so that there's actual documentation and you have that documentation i do I and actually, the courts have not looked at that uh, the courts um and i stated that i stated to the court that um, i'm 110 percent in compliance and before i wrote my motion for clarification uh, on their order which was partially legible um i stated my my caseworker's name and that I had contact and I had uh, received since inception of child support from my case, I have all my records. And I'm in good standings. And their reply was? Uh, they don't reply. They deny. They, they check a box that says deny. That's it. Where are you going to go from here? Yeah, what, what's, the, what's the next stage? I'm, are, are you just permanently separated from your child? Correct. Um, I'm scared. Um, I'm scared for my son's health and well-being, and, and really at this point, my own. I'm reaching out to you because I'm not sure where else to go. I need, uh, I need help. I need help to have my son back in my life and vice versa, uh, to be back in my son's life. It, it, it almost seems as though this is state-sponsored child abuse in that a, a child being separated from a loving parent is... Is, uh, is suffering because of, of, obviously, the separation. We've heard this on many different cases. Jared Stevens, uh, Ms. Mueller, uh, uh, Audrey uh, Shore, uh, David Johnson hasn't seen his daughter in years. Not charged with a crime. Not charged with a crime. Uh, on and on and on and on, and there seems to be a continual pattern that one parent is, is, is separated from the child and then a series of judges, a series of guardian ad litems, and a lot of money transpires, and the child grows up with two, three, five, 
seven years. We have some cases that are actually going to the New Hampshire Supreme Court and, and beyond because they're not uh, following the basic protocols and in, in making sure that what is in the child's best interest Correct. is a settled case with the, the United States Supreme Court that both parents and on a routine basis. So the state and the state representative, the state senate, needs to take a hard look at this and find out why are these judges separating these children from their parents if they've committed no crime. They're committing a crime against these children and their civil rights are being violated. And what happens to routine these cases across our country, this isn't a, just a New Hampshire case, this is happening in California, Florida, throughout the, the country, where parents are routinely separated and shaken down. It's a cottage industry, and it needs to be exposed. There's a, a video out, uh, a movie out called Divorce Court, where it shows the process of how this all takes place. And the real victims, yes, it's the parents, but also the children. And what happens to society? We've had Dr. Uh, Linda Gottlieb on our show, and we've had the, uh, Dr. Kornbluth on our show, and we've had a number of doctors tell us about what happens to society when sons and daughters are separated from their, their parents. Uh, if you watch Intervention, you'll, you'll see how some of these kids were living productive lives, the marriage died, something bad happened. But then, because of the separation from one of the parents, the children started moving off into drugs, violent crimes. Yeah, well, yeah, right, because they're acting out. I mean, I'd, I'd like to address quickly that you said um, that you had some doctors on the show. Um, so the, the family court actually uh, mandated um, counseling for my son, um, which both parents, myself and his mother, agreed to wholeheartedly. Well, this is a good thing. Right. Even though we couldn't agree on anything together, we agreed that that was proper for him. And... Um, the first two um, counselors he saw were very, um, very astute and referenced right away that Gregory needed his father in his life. Um, right away, his Is mother. Is that in writing? Oh yes, and I I gave that to the court and to the guardian ad litem. Um, so his mother um, right away took him right out of that counseling, found another counselor, um, which is the. Um, which I would definitely like to say their name, the Counseling Center, um, they're right here in, in actually Nashua, New Hampshire. And um, his counselor, Heather Gallagher, was definitely underqualified to service Gregory. Um, Gregory at this time was um, I think nine and a half years old, and she said that her age range ended around six, so I couldn't understand why she would service or and or counsel Gregory. But that being said, um, when, the, when this all started happening, um, we, the parents, were unable to see any of the records from the counselor, um, which I just obtained less than 10 days ago. And it's um, some 95 pages. Um, and I read, um, I read it backwards, which would mean the, the, the latest. And one of the things that the counselor says in her statement, um, which is you know in his file, is that um, she doesn't know how to act or, or counsel Gregory properly because she is confused and or un, um, not properly educated in the divorce situation and court situation and to be able to help Gregory. Did you pay for this counselor? Uh, that counselor was $125 an hour. How, many, how much did you pay the total? Um, a, a couple thousand. I, the, the dollar amounts, Kevin, are staggering. I, mean, I know it, that, it's, but it's, that's it, why I'm it, trying to go through this, this whole process. Yeah. There is a cottage industry, which is basically re reaffirmed with this, with this whole documentary. And it is a documentary, and it's a well-done documentary. And the reason I brought that up is because uh, uh, there, there are many complaints. And even though you bring these evidences to the courts, which are exculpatory or exonerate or whatever, you, or, or, or show that you are a good parent, uh, in, in my mind, that in itself is a violation of, of your civil rights because you don't have to prove you're innocent. You don't have to prove you're a good parent. That, in my mind, is a violation of both yours and your son's constitutional rights. And it's being 
violated on a routine basis. But when you go to these counselors and you pay good tax, good money, and the court pushes it aside, this evidence is, is, is not, we don't need this. There's a rule. It's called Rule 1.2, waiver of rules, that the courts are very familiar with. So you bring in the court-ordered evidence, and in the, in the interest of justice, they waive these rules of evidence. Right. And, and in, instead of acting like a regular court, they're a court of equity, which seem to uh, be outside the jurisdiction of our Constitution. And they're in this nebulous zone where nobody can seem to touch it. And the problem that we're finding is that Representatives, senators, need to understand that this is happening on a routine basis, ongoing, throughout our state for years. And we need to take a look at it, and we need to deal with it. This is not going away. And I'm going to ask you, people out there, if you have an issue like this, you need to contact me at speakupnh at gmail.com. I want to hear your story. I want to know what's going on. Have it documented. We, we have people that come in with documentation. It's the only way that we're going to fix this problem. Because your children are at stake, and you're not alone. On a routine basis, people come to me and they say, I thought I was the only one. There are hundreds, there are thousands of people out there that are going through the same syndrome parental alienation. For your child's best interest, please contact me. Until next week, David, thank you very much for coming on the show. Uh, we're going to get your message out, and we're going to try to bring this before uh, some legislatures so that they can take a fresh look at this that's going on. So, uh, Until next week, thank you for watching Speak Up, and uh, we hope uh, this helps you in, in some way. Sure. Thank, you. All right. thank you for watching Speak Up, and we want to thank our sponsor, Aardvark, the Dean of Clean, the carpet cleaner in the Nashua area. If you want to contact them, call 603-521-7657. Thanks for watching. Every day, citizens around the country are faced with new dilemmas, dilemmas that affect them profoundly. Whether it's injustice, discrimination, falling through the cracks, scandals and cronyism, balances of power, ethics, religious freedom, state versus citizens and unfunded mandates, and the list goes on and on and on. Welcome to Speak Up. It's directed at those who have fallen through the cracks and it gives them a voice. It's your turn to speak up, to stand up and fight back. The preceding program was provided by an independent producer solely responsible for its content. The opinions expressed do not necessarily represent the views of this station, its staff, board of directors, or underwriters.